Okay, I think that uh, while people are still coming in, I'll say a few words of uh, introduction. So uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone who's come and joined us this evening. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, for me, I get such pleasure from seeing the, the faces of the people I know and that I've worked with for so many years and uh, to see you together on my screen. It's, it, it, it's really lovely. And uh, we're here for the next session of our Up Close and Personal series. This is actually the ninth of these sessions, but it's the beginning of a new unit and the unit of this time work, we've called it at our best, but it's sharing best practices between our communities. All of our communities do lots of different things, but uh, some people do things well and some things do things amazingly well. And uh, we thought it would be interesting to have a unit where we looked at some of the core activities that we do and share between ourselves our thoughts and our lessons and the things that we've learned uh, along the way. So this is the first of this uh, uh, last unit and uh, it's one of six. And this evening, we've decided to talk about national organizations and a few words perhaps of uh, introduction. And I'll start with a parable. Imagine a person living on their own. So they live on their own and uh, after a very long time, they meet another person. It's guaranteed that the first thought that is going to go through their mind is, wow, another person just like me. We share so much in common. And guaranteed that the next thought that's going to go through their mind is, wow, we're so different. Because in our relationship with other people, we have commonalities and we have differences. The common drives us to want to do things together. When I see someone with which I share something, I think, wow, if we work together, it would be so much better. There's so much that we could achieve by working together. But the differences are the things that drive us apart. And every community and every organization is constantly struggling with the tension between the, the forces that bring us together and the forces that tear us apart. And communities are really an exercise in managing those forces. When you do it well, Wow, you can achieve amazing things if you can harness the talents, if you can, uh, the, the, the energy, the, the dreams, the aspirations, uh, the skills of the people in your community. If you can bring them together into one focus, wow, you can achieve such amazing things. But if you don't manage to, to channel those that tension the what, what what can i say when when a community fails it also wow does it fail well the, the, the those forces are so powerful now what i've said about a community you can multiply it many times over when it comes to national organizations our communities i think one of the features of uh, uh, Masorti communities, particularly in Europe, is that many of us feel alone. Most of our communities are small communities. Most of our communities work in places where Masorti is a minority, and it's not just a minority, it's an oppressed minority. Everyone uh, in, the in the larger Jewish community seems to be against us. And when we find another Masoti community, we have that thing, wow, we're not alone. Wow, we can do things together. And that brings us to build the institutions 
that bring us together. That is, is the force that brings about in every country where there are two, three, four, five, six Masoretic communities to create a national organization. And the national organization is the place where the building of the Masoti movement really happens. And uh, we have different national organizations. We have Masoti in the UK, we have Masoti France, we have Masoti Spain, we have Masoti Judaism, uh, uh, Germany, we have Masoti uh, uh, Netherlands. And each of those organizations does the work that it does. And each of those organizations struggles with the internal tensions that are inherent in that organization. Tonight, We've chosen Masoti UK, it's the largest, and, and, and I think it does impressive amount of work and impressive work. And I think that hearing about how Masoti UK works can be an inspiration for Masoti in other countries, but obviously every country is different. So every country is going to structure and build its national organization in a different way. The idea here isn't a model that everyone will copy. The idea is to raise the questions so that we learn what do we need to think about when we think about our national organizations. And perhaps we'll learn how to do things better. And with that in mind, we're going to, to start with the, the session tonight. We have three speakers. Uh, each will be talking about a different aspect of the of, of Masoti UK and some of the questions I've, I've, I've directed our speakers to address some of the questions that I think all of the national organizations in Europe are struggling with. The first of our speakers is uh, Simon Samuels. He's a past uh, chair of uh, Masoti UK. And I've asked him to talk about the question of structure. How do you build the national organiza organization? Uh, who gets to say what the national organization does? And how do you manage what's the, I think the most difficult tension within the national organization? And that is the relationship between a national organization and the communities. Who decides what you do? How do you reach decisions together? Those are kind of key questions. And I've, I've asked Simon to, to talk about how they do that in the UK and particularly perhaps how their thinking about how to structure their national organization has changed over time because of successes and because of failures over the years. So please, Simon, uh, uh, pleased to welcome you and the floor is yours. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you very much. Good, good evening to everybody. Um, it's a real privilege actually to present to this group. I'm also um, kind of quite mindful that, you know, my I'm the opening speaker and I'm talking about the issue of governance, which on the face of it is kind of a very, very boring subject, but it is certainly we think in the UK has been pretty important to achieving lots of the work that Mazzotti has been able to achieve. Um, so what I want to do is tell you a little bit about how the governance structure used to be uh, in the UK and the changes that we made um, four or five years ago and to kind of reflect on how those changes have worked and in some cases uh, are still work in progress. One thing I should also say is I think I'm right in saying that um, we're really happy and open to take questions um, but I think the intention is to maybe hold, hold off questions until both myself, Matt and Harriet have spoken and at the end we'll move over to talking uh, to, to answering any questions that you might have. So that, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm only going to speak for about 10 minutes or so. And let me start. Um, I'm now hoping that you can see broadly a back blank screen, which I'm going to start by just explaining the old model that, that we used to uh, govern ourselves by, um, which um, was essentially a representative model. Um, and so the way it used to work was um, we had... Uh, a number of communities. Uh, this is not necessarily accurate, but a number of communities. Um, and every community, uh, and, and then we had at the center of Mazorti a council, and, and every community uh, essentially provided a trustee to uh, represent them at the council. So, so that was the broad structure. So every community was represented by a trustee. Um, and uh, in addition to that, 
there was an executive group uh, which was comprised of uh, the chairs of the community of the Mazzotti movement, the treasurer, uh, and some staff, uh, the director of NOAM, the chief executive, and some rabbinical input, senior rabbi, and the Bet Din. So, so, so that was the, the previous structure. Now, um, that there were a variety of problems with this structure. Um, and uh, they essentially came down to a few different issues. Uh, uh, sorry, apologies. The other point to say is the staff were sort of clearly quite separate from this. This is a governance issue rather than an operational issue. Well, as, as I've already mentioned, both the chief executive and the director of NOAM, uh, as well as being employees and staff, were also on the executive. Um, in addition to this, we had um, sort of outside of the constitution, a couple of other things. One was a um, uh, an informal meeting of all of the chairs of all of the individual shuls. It was informal, it wasn't particularly structured, it met twice a year, so it didn't meet very frequently. That was all the shul chairs coming together. Um, and the other thing was the official executive um, Actually, in many cases, we found that even the decision making within that was quite cumbersome. So a, a sort of an unofficial executive, a smaller, a, a still smaller group of people tend to meet and make a lot of the operational decisions around the movement. So I've already mentioned that there are a variety of problems with this model. Um, the, the first problem was, and in fact, perhaps the most important problem was a very simple confusion about the role of those trustees, those trustees representing each individual shul. Um, were they there with their community hats on or were they there to represent the entire Mazzotti movement? And there were constant tensions around what their, their, their purpose was. And, and broadly, I'd say most of them saw their purpose as representing their individual communities rather than representing the wider the wider movement. The second uh, uh, problem with that structure was almost by definition, it wasn't skills based. So by which I mean the trustees that were attending the council that each community sent were chosen by the communities uh, and were not mindful of the skills that the council needed. So for example, they could all be accountants or they could all be lawyers or they could all be eight HR professionals or none of them could be any of those things so so we had a second problem which was that the the skills balance was 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 lacking uh, it's also fair to say that there was a diversity balance lacking again because the 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 communities themselves were the people who were actually uh, presenting the trustees to attend the council uh the um already mentioned the council members tended to be very focused on their communities. The smaller executive tends to be much more focused on the management of resorty Judaism. Um, and I think because of that, the council meetings tended to be very cumbersome. They essentially lacked strategy in terms of the wider Mazzotti movement. And I think it's also fair to say, and you know, I'll say this, um, this is not universal, but it was often the case and if I put it in quite sort of simple language, generally the shuls did not provide their best members to this to this council. In, in many cases, the shuls would often send people to the Mazzotti Judaism Council because the shul was unable to offer them another role within their own community. And, and typically the best people tended to be the busiest people in their existing shuls who didn't have the time to do whatever it was they were doing for their existing community and at the same time to uh to, to, to volunteer for Mazzotti Judaism. So those were the kind of the variety of the problems of the model. And so uh four, four and a half years ago, we went through a, a very dramatic change. And so the new model is um, we've obviously still got all of our existing communities, uh, but now what happens is um we um uh advertise. Um, both directly to members and also via the shuls themselves. We advertise for trustees to join a board, a trustee board that is, uh, has oversight for governance of Mazzotti Judaism. Um, the um, communities, uh, can the, it's not a question that the communities send people to the, the board, the actual individual people themselves come forward. We have a nominations committee 
And that nominations committee considers the skills that are needed for the board and considers whether the applicants who've applied have got the necessary skills. And then every year at the AGM, the annual general meeting, uh, the members of Mazzotti Judaism, which are the actual shuls themselves, can vote on the candidates who are put forward by the nominations committee to become a trustee of the organization. So, so it's completely different. It's, it's, we've moved away from a representative model. It is possible that some shuls will have no, no, no member of that shul is a trustee. Others will have multiple trustees. Um, clearly, the intention of the nominations committee is to ensure the appropriate skill set. It also, the nominations committee, tries to ensure an appropriate diversity by gender, um, by age. Um, and so, so what we've tried to create, in fact, we have created, is a, a trustee board that has got the appropriate skills uh, to manage the organization in the way that we'd always intended. Now, um, the uh, obvious question then is, well, where does that leave the communities in terms of their direct voice within Mazzotti Judaism? Um, and so the second thing that we did on the left-hand side is we uh, essentially made the chairs forum uh, constitute a part of the constitute the new constitution, and the chairs forum meets um, well. It, it needs to meet at least every three months, so four times a year. It is attended by the chairs of all of the communities. Um, in fact, during the pandemic, it has probably met. I'm going to say between fifteen and twenty times in the last year. So at some points every two weeks, but certainly every month. Um, and that's become the, the, the sort of a very important outlet by which the individual communities can directly express their own views um, as, as a group. And that can be fed into the trustee group directly as well. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got um, a clearer delineation. We've got the staff, the chief executive, um, along with um, uh, senior rabbis and, and other paid staff of Mazzotti Judaism. So, so we've moved from a skills uh, from a representative model to a skills based model. Um, I think the just to kind of reflect the concerns of the community at the beginning of this change was whether their voice would be lost. Um, we have made huge attempts to ensure that's not the case. Clearly, the chairs forum is a very important part of that as a formal channel. There's also lots of informal channels. Um, and indeed, looking forward, you know, one of the ideas that we might consider is to actually make a, each trustee have some kind of responsibility for the linkage to individual communities, not necessarily a, a community that they themselves are a member of, but to a specific community. So, so, so we are trying to always think about ways in which we can make the formal channels and the informal channels in terms of the relationships with Mazzotti Judaism in the UK and the communities stronger. Um, the, um, uh, the model, I'd say, has broadly been a huge success. I mean, in every election now, every year since this model has been in place, we've had com competitive elections for the board, by which I mean there's been more applicants than places. The nominations committee has been through a process, and typically the nominations committee has recommended more applicants than places. So there has been a competitive election uh, in each of the last three years since the new system has been in place. So conscious of time, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop screen sharing as well. Um, but hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavor of the governance structure, how it's changed from a representative to a skills based model, but retained a relationship with the individual communities. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon. And you've already, I think, highlighted one of the, the key questions, which uh, uh, we're all going to reflect on, and that is that there's an inherent tension between communities and a national organization. And uh, the, uh, the national organization, I think, succeeds to the extent that it can transcend its communities. But uh, you pointed out to, to that tension, and that's something that I think we're going to hear about again. And from my experience, I work with all of the national organizations uh, uh, across Europe, that uh, managing those tensions is actually the key issue that we have uh, uh, 
uh, with our national, uh, within our national organizations. And it's something that I think that we're going to have to come back to. In any case, we're moving now to, to Matt Blaine. Matt Plan is the, exec, uh, uh, the executive, chief executive of uh, Masoti Judaism UK. And uh, that's a senior professional uh, uh, position. Matt, uh, you, you've been around for many years. I've always been impress, in, impressed by your broad strategic thinking and uh, the way you've whipped us all into order. And really the, the, the movement has, has grown from strength to strength under your leadership and under your guidance. So uh, look forward to hearing from you. And we want to hear from you kind of what do you do and what are you planning to do in the future? We are, your strategic thinking about uh, what, what you want Masoti to do. Great, thank you, Chaim. It's nice to thank you for all your, your compliments and the nice things you said. And uh, it's a, we can be a mutual fan club because I always enjoy working with you as well. And uh, so, so, so all, all of your thought, all of your feelings are mutual. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here and it's nice to see so many familiar faces from across the world, really, from Europe and across the world. I will do my best to speak slowly <laughs> so that the, the interpreters can uh, manage with me and that everyone can understand. Um, so I apologize if I go too fast. Uh, it's something I, I, I struggle with. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk about, so Simon talked very, um, I th Simon talked, I think, very interestingly about the structures within which we make our decisions. And how can we balance the voices? <clears throat> how do we balance the voices of our communities with the needs of the movement as a whole? And what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes is what are the decisions that we make? In other words, what's the content of the decisions that those bodies take? And how do we make sure that those decisions serve the movement as a whole and are strategic and visionary, but at the same time also meet the, meet the needs of the communities? Um, because it seems to me that if the movement, if a, if a national movement is going to hold together, it has to do two things. Number one, it has to be, it has to take convincing and compelling action and it has to drive forwards. And at the same time, it has to maintain good relationships with all of its members and stakeholders and its communities. And sometimes those two goals are in tension with each other. So how do we go about that? So. Before I, I'm also going to share, show you some slides in a second, but before I do that, um, I just, I'll just describe for a minute how we go about doing our strategic planning. And I'll, I'll use just a, a simple metaphor to describe the process. The metaphor is that we open up and then we close down and then we open up again. And what does that mean? The opening up is that we start off by talking to everybody and listening to everybody. So we try and understand the needs of our communities. We talk to our lay leaders we talk to our donors, we talk to our existing trustees, we talk to our rabbis and chazanim, we talk to our staff, we try and understand their needs, where they are, how they perceive the organization. We've just done a very um, broad listening exercise like that, led by Simon actually, to really get a good sense of what everyone's views are about where the movement should be going and what the community's needs are. That's the opening up. We then close down with a smaller group that creates a plan based on what they've heard and based on what they think the correct strategic direction should be. And we then open up again by consulting with everyone again on that plan and tweaking it and making sure that it meets everybody's needs. And that you can hear that there's a tension in that between on the one hand, really listening to everybody. And on the other hand, being creating a plan which is gonna be effective that will drive forward the movement, sometimes in directions that the individual communities might not have prioritized or might not even like. And there's a, ba there's a balance between those two things. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and show you a few slides just to give you a taste of the, the, uh, the planning process that we, that we use. So I'm hoping that everybody can see that slide with our logo on the front. Um, and the, these are the elements of strategy that we think about when we're doing this process. So the first thing we think about, and I'm gonna give you some examples of this in a minute, is, is our purpose, why? Why do we exist as a movement? What is our purpose in the world? That's the first thing we need to be really clear about. And we've spent a lot of time getting that right because without understanding why we exist, we can't think about what we want to do. 
The second stage of planning the strategy is to be very clear on our values. In other words, what is the unique way that we do, that we fulfill our purpose? For example, there are lots of Jewish organizations with a similar purpose to ours, but the way we achieve our purpose, our values is what's unique about us. That's the how, and we need to be very clear on that. The third stage is a vision, what? What is it we want to create? And the way I like to do vision is to really think, to think, you know, imagine 10 years in the future, what will the movement look like? What are gonna be the important facts about the movement in 10 years time if everything goes well? And really imagine it in concrete terms. And again, we can, I can show, we can talk about examples of that, but it might be, we are gonna have 20 rabbis. We are going to have 30 communities. We are going to have 6,000 members. Or it could be qualitative things, like every member of the movement is going to be more Jewishly literate. Every member of the movement will have improved their level of Hebrew. So there can be all kinds of um, elements to that vision. Four, aims and priorities, is what I like to call strategic bridges. I didn't make up that name. I can't remember who did. I, I apologize. Um, but the strategic bridges are the things that lead us from where we are now to our vision. So if, for example, now we have 10 rabbis in the movement and we want to have 20 rabbis in the movement, what are the pieces of work we need to do to get us from 10 to 20? And those, those will be the strategic bridges. Once we've established those strategic bridges, we can then um, go about the business of, excuse the expression, the business of business planning. In other words, setting concrete goals and deciding how we're going to achieve them. So what are the goals we need to achieve what are the pieces of work we need to do? How much is it going to cost? Where are we going to find the money? What staff do we need? Okay, so that's the, what volunteers do we need? Who else do we need to get involved? So that's stage five. And then finally, stage six, implementation and evaluation. We go to work and we work a year at a time. We set goals, we track progress, and we evaluate all the time. And on the back of the evaluation, we can constantly tweak our plans and make sure that we're achieving the things that we set out to do in our vision, values, and purpose. So that's, that's the scheme. I'll just give you a few examples of where we are with that now. And, and I should say that we're about to develop a new strategic plan. So this still reflects the plan that we've been in for the last three years. And we, we try and do a three year planning cycle. So for example, here's our purpose, as we currently say it, the purpose of Masorti Judaism is to develop flourishing communities rooted in traditional practice and modern values where people can find meaning by connecting to Judaism and to each other. And I hope what's clear in there is we didn't just say that our purpose is to develop Masorti communities. We asked the question why, and we went a bit deeper and we got to the, we got to the answer that we want people to find meaning by connecting to Judaism and to each other. That's the purpose, okay? Um, and obviously different organizations could have different purposes. Another example, here are some of our aims and priorities which, which we developed. I'm not gonna talk about values and vision now, just for lack of time, but we, we identify four aims or priorities, which are the pieces of work we want to do. So number one, we want to develop our synagogue communities and developing our synagogue communities means doing everything to help our communities grow and thrive and develop. So that might mean training rabbis, placing rabbis, training lay leaders, supporting community chairs, providing them with advice and resources. Um, lots of different kinds of work fit under that bracket. Number two, supporting youth, young adults and young families. The main thrust of that work is Noam and Marom. And I won't say too much more about that now. Um, and, it's, and, and by the way, it should be clear that aims one and two directly support our existing communities. Aim three, we called nurturing Jewish innovation. And this is about thinking, thinking very carefully about the growing number of Jewish people who want to be involved with Jewish community, but don't want synagogue. That's not the kind of Jewish community they want. They're not joining our shuls. They're not members of our synagogues, but they want Jewish community. And what alternative experimental innovative models can we create to meet the needs of those people to bring them Jewish community? Again, in line with our purpose. Um, that, by the way, meets the needs of our synagogues much less directly. So that's an example of where we're trying to do something which is not directly aligned with what meets 
our synagogue's immediate needs now. I think it's good for them in the, in the long term. And then finally, promoting our ideas or Jewish thought leadership. And that's about raising the profile of our rabbis and thinkers and teachers and our vision of Judaism and having that influence the rest of the Jewish community. So those are just some examples of, the, of our aims and priorities. Out of those aims and priorities flow our projects. And here are some examples of the projects we're currently working on in order to achieve those aims. And I'm not going to read them all out, but you can get the sense of what they're about. Lots of, so there's, there's leadership training activities. We have an LGBT inclusion project. We have advice for synagogue chairs. We have NAM projects. We have Jewish learning activities. We support our senior rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg, to raise the profile of the movement and so on. So that's a list of projects that we work on. And we decided on those projects based on the strategy, which I've already explained. And the idea is that each project advances one of, the, one of our aims. Um, and then the final thing I'll just share with you is how do, we, how do we keep track of that? How do we make sure that we're actually working to the plan? Because as I'm sure everyone's aware, it's very uh, easy to come up with a good strategy and then have it on a piece of paper and never look at it. So that's what we wanted to avoid. And the way we make sure that we work to the plan is as follows. And this is just a, a short extract of a working document that we use. And I hope you can see that um, reasonably clearly. But what we do is we develop a set of goals to guide our work for the year. So just on the left hand side, you can see some of the goals we've developed. So for example, if you look at number two, it says run a Jewish community organizing course. That's a, a leadership course for lay leaders. And it says Rachel, which is the name of the staff person responsible for that. We then break that down into, into key performance indicators. In other words, what are the, how are we gonna know if we've achieved that goal? So here, for example, we say, we want to run eight sessions for a minimum of 15 participants from five communities. And we want 80% of the participants to evaluate their experience and learning process positively. An example of, of one of these KPIs. We then have a, a RAG rating, red, amber, or green. So during the year, each month, we can track. Green means on track, we're doing well. Amber means there's some concern, and red means we're in trouble. So this was green when we filled out this chart. And then there is a space for comments. And we use this document as a as a staff team in order to track progress all the time. And if we see there's a problem, we can adjust course. Um, I'm gonna stop there uh, and hopefully there'll be some time afterwards. Hopefully I'll still, I have to leave a little bit early. I apologize because we have another meeting, but hopefully there'll be time for questions afterwards. So thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Absolutely uh, uh, fascinating. Each time I hear you go over <clears throat> your strategic plan, I say, wow, how do you keep on top of all of that? But the amazing thing is that you do keep on top of all of that. And I've written down all kinds of questions that I have for you, but I'm, uh, we said we're going to keep the questions for later. So you've been warned. In any case, uh, uh, we're ready to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Harriet Oppenheimer, and Harriet is one of the chairs, the, the, the leaders of New North London Synagogue, which is the largest of the synagogues in the UK. And I've asked Harriet to come and talk a little bit about the relationship between communities and national organizations, because I've already mentioned that that can be, that can be difficult and that can be fraught. And uh, I, I wanted to see the national organization, not only from the point of view of the national organization, but also from the point of view of the, the community. We discussed whether to bring someone from a small community or someone from a large community. And I was the one who really wanted from the large community. I think that it's always clear to the small communities what they get from the national organization. But uh, the larger communities uh, who put so much into the national organization on one hand and have so many capabilities to do things on their own on the other hand, uh, have to think more about what they want from their national organization. And with that in mind, uh, moving over to Harriet and tell us a little bit about New North London Synagogue and your relationship with Masorti Judaism and how you think about uh, Masorti Judaism. Thank you, Chaim. And good evening, everybody. It's, it's great to be with you this evening. And thank you for asking me. 
Um, I wasn't going to say this, but given the introduction that you've just given me, I should say that maybe you get two speakers for the price of one, because actually, if you go back over 20 years, um, I am one of the founder members of ASIF, which was London's first traditional egalitarian minyan. It is now part of New North London, but it wasn't when it started. And it's my kind of small community or rather non-existent community story for, for Masorti, because um, I and a couple of other people had a vision that we wanted to do this, to set up a traditional egalitarian minyan, but we didn't know who else was interested. And the way that we created Asif was to go to Masorti and to say, who else is there out there that might want to do this? The interesting thing was that Masorti then gave us a list of people, most of whom we knew, <laughs> but we hadn't quite worked out that they all wanted the same thing. But it's quite a nice story about how a, a, a structure, a community structure that's not a shul like Masorti can actually connect people beyond the walls of the synagogue. Um, if you fast forward about 23, four years, more than I care to remember, um, I'm now one of the chairs of New North London. Um, I've been a member of New North London for, for most of those years, actually. Um, and New North London is definitely the largest Masorti shul in the UK. It's a thriving community shul, not only within Masorti, but it's within the heart of Jewish London. Um, we, uh, we're a shul, we're a community centre, we have a nursery, we have a cheder, we have just under 3,500 members, I think, about 3,000, somewhere between 3,300 3, and 3,500. 3, um, I won't be more precise because we shouldn't be counting Jews anyway. Um, but we're significantly the largest by any measure um, within, within uh, uh, the UK's Masorti movement. Um, and we are really remarkably self-sufficient. And we think of ourselves as as such. Um, we've not only have we got size, but we've we're very lucky with a hugely professional and skilled community. There are lots of lay leaders within New North London, and we can do an awful lot of things for ourselves. And uh, we have lots of ambition to do lots of things. We're in the middle of a conversation at the moment about what we have learned as a community from COVID and from the pandemic and what are some of the innovations that we've experienced in our various different walks of life through the last 16 months that might be things that we want to bring back and build into the future of our community. So we think very expansively as a community and we think that we are um, you know, capable of doing a lot. We, we, we have high, high standards for ourselves as a community and high ambitions for ourselves. Despite that, I think we think that it's really important that we've got a strong relationship with Masorti Judaism. And we don't fly solo as a community, even though we kind of could, because we are you know, very significantly large. But I, I want to talk about some of the things that we think it's really important to get from Masorti Judaism. And in many ways, it's just the other half of what Matt has just talked about. Um, so, so the first I'll talk about is, is Noam um, and provision for our kids. Now we've got a huge number of kids within New North London. We just, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the introduction session for the next, for, for the group of children who will have their bar or bat mitzvah in two or three years time. And there were 90 children in that group. And that's just one year's cohort mixture of boys and girls. It's an enormous number, but we still don't think that that's got the right order of magnitude for the kind of youth movement that we want. Um, and for our kids to experience youth camps and, you know, youth development in a way that is very much Masorti driven, but also beyond the walls of our synagogue. And we definitely look to uh, Masorti for that. Um, we, we need that kind of order of magnitude and we need the professionalism with which Noam and Noam camps are run. Um, and I actually, I think it's very important that isn't just the synagogue because I think kids want to grow up and move beyond the immediate synagogue and, and, and explore, you know, a little bit further away from where their parents are, even if it's still within the sortie. So I think that's really important. Um, another area 
at different times of the shul's life that is really important is rabbinic development. You know, where do we find our next rabbis at various different times? And, you know, I think you can know as a, as a shul that there are times when you might be coming to the point where you are looking for another rabbi, but, and then there's other years when of course you're not because we don't all look for a rabbi every year, thank God. Um, uh, but, but it's not, it's just not practical for a community to be seeking to, to be doing the whole kind of life cycle of rabbinic development the whole time, particularly um, going back to what Chaim said at the beginning about where, you know, Masorti is a small movement and however much we within New North London feel that we're big because we're in the heart of Jewish London and we're the biggest Masorti shul, actually a pipeline of rabbis for a small movement is a really important thing to build beyond what each individual synagogue can build. And because the life cycle of when each synagogue is going to want their rabbis is going to be different. Another conversation that we're having, which is very live at the moment with Masorti Judaism, is young adults. Um, and I think it's particularly important because when I say young adults, I'm, I mean, I'm probably talking about people between about 18 and about 30, but we could have a whole other evening at some point on what we mean by young adults, so I won't go further than that. But they're probably people who have got a much more mobile life and not necessarily members of one shul. And there's an interesting conversation about what is the synagogue's responsibility and what should be the synagogue's aspirations around young adults and what might be a sense of belonging beyond uh, beyond the synagogue. And I know that um, Matt has been, or Masorti Judaism has been using the language of Masorti curious people. And I think that's really helpful language. If you're Masorti curious, at some point, we as a synagogue are going to be really interested in you and you may be interested in us, but you may not be yet because you may not be at a life stage where you're even thinking of joining a shul. Actually, community development more broadly is also, I think, important for us, even though given our size as New North London, we might often be in quite a leading role in that Masorti community development. Um, I don't want to give ourselves airs and graces that are, are not realistic, but I think we've got quite a lot of the leadership of Masorti in the UK just because of our size. But I think, and I speak as a parent, so I've got children who are 16, 18 and 20. Um, and when I think about where my kids are going to be in the future, I want there to be viable um, Masorti communities for them to be part of. And they may not be in my part of London. They may not be in my part of the UK. So I think it's, you know, I think one of the things that we want as a big community is to be able to get to the point that there's other communities beyond that our kids may be part of in the future. So I think even if you're a strong big community, it's really helpful to know that there's a Masorti movement out there that's helping them in the future. Um, I suppose just one other thing I'll just mention and then and then I'll, I'll close because I know that there's we won't want to have time for questions at the end. Um, but the one other thing is about leadership development. Again, it's something that I think because of the scale of any community, any shul community, even a big one like ours. I think when we want to develop our lay leaders, we don't want to be doing it just within our community. We want to be doing it within a broader context um, and to have an ability to send our um, our lay leaders on a, on a kind of structured lay leadership course to be able to um, meet other communities, meet other lay leaders, consider themselves in context actually, and not just consider ourselves as, as the large community that we are. These things are really helpful. Um, and I think that we just couldn't do them within one synagogue. I think we can do a huge amount for ourselves and I think we do, but I think we'd become quite insular if we did the things that I've discussed um, just for ourselves as a community and not as part of a broader movement. Thank you. That was all I was going to say now, but I'm very happy to take any questions. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Harriet. Uh, <clears throat> kind of, you gave us a really good uh, picture and a good place to, to start from. I'm looking at my watch and I'm starting to feel the pressure. So I'm going to move straight on to questions. And uh, I want to catch Matt before he disappears. And I know that uh, Matt needs to leave early because you have another meeting that you're going to immediately. So I have two questions for you, Matt. The first is, uh, how do you pay for it? And the second 
is uh, you gave a list of the kind of projects that you're working on. And I'd like you to talk in more detail. Choose one if you want, but if you don't want to choose, if you could say a few words about the rabbinic pipeline. How do you think about the rabbis that you're going to have in two years' time and in five years' time and in 10 years' time in England? I think that that's a good example of the way Masota UK works. It's out of those two, you promised hard questions. Out of those two questions, I can't decide which one is harder. Um, how do we pay for it, first of all? So we currently have a budget of a, as a movement, or just as, as the organization of Sorty UK. Our budget is approximately one point, let's just say 1.2 million pounds um, per year. And approximately, to break it down really simply, approximately half of that, so 600,000 pounds, is income paid by families for NOAM programs, so for summer camps in Israel, Israel programs. And the remaining £600,000 very broadly breaks down. Um, half is uh, membership fees. So our communities pay a per member fee to us. They pay more. The bigger communities pay more. The smaller communities pay less. And the remainder, so another, let's say, the final £300,000, give or take, we have to raise in voluntary donations. And that breaks down. We raise about a third of that from trusts and foundations, so grants. We raise a third of that from major donors, so people who can give us £3,000 plus per year. And we raise about £100,000 of that in small donations. So that's from fundraising events um, and campaigns that we run. Um, and that also means we have to invest some of our money in fundraising. And we're now currently thinking about how much to invest in fundraising and how best to have a small fundraising team within the movement to make sure we have that money. So I hope that answered the first question, Chaim. Um, the second question, uh, so rabbinic, I think rabbinic training is a really good example. And our principle with rabbinic training is that if you want to appoint one rabbi now, then you have to have 100 potential rabbinical students 10 years ago. Uh, to put it another way, if we want to have one rabbi in 10 years, we need 100 potential students now. So that's our thinking. So the, our thinking is all about a, um, a funnel, well, leading downwards, I guess. In the, in, the, in the top of the funnel, we pour in lots of young people and we try and engage them with Jewish learning and religious practice and Jewish identity and being part of the Jewish community and leadership. And the funnel gradually narrows and narrows and narrows until at the other end, we have a small number of people who are interested in rabbinical training. And... How do, we, how do we make that work? So we try and do, first of all, we're running Noam and Marom, and we have lots and lots and lots of young people. We then try and capture a smaller subset of those young people who are more interested in Jewish learning, serious Jewish learning and Jewish life, and we try and give them programming that meets their needs. For example, at Bet Midrash, we have been running for 16 and 17 year olds for the last two years. Out of that group, we try and capture the ones who are still interested as young adults in Jewish learning, a smaller group, and then we program for them. For example, we try and run programming at the conservative yeshiva in Jerusalem to give them more study skills, more Jewish learning skills, develop them more as leaders. And as they come out of that process as graduates and as young adults, we then try and identify the smaller number who might be interested in rabbinical training. And what we found is that for, from doing that process, we actually do have quite a good pipeline of students. So at the moment, we have one student who is in training and will be graduate receiving smicha next year. We have a second student in training who will be receiving smicha in three years time. We have a number of people who are thinking about rabbinical training. One, one candidate who's entering a year of serious Jewish learning now and will hopefully enter rabbinical training next year. Um, and I think the process works. And one of the things that we're very proud about is the way we managed to feed young rabbis back into the system to then inspire the next generation as, um, as role models. And so, so far, it seems to work. Thank you so much. Now, I know that you need to run. So I apologize um, for that. Right. So we're apologizing for your early exit. But I want to say the thank you now, because I think that uh, your present presentation has been really inspirational. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. We'll hear more from you. It's been wonderful to see everyone. Nice to see you all. Okay. Good luck with everything. Thank you for all your hard work. Bye-bye. And, and I'm going to move on to Simon. And I have some questions for you too, Simon. 
And uh, uh, the, the two questions that I have for you, which are, is also something that I know that all of our national organizations struggle with, uh, if you could comment a little bit on recruitment of the trustees, how do you actually find the people who are willing to give the time and to take the responsibility uh, uh, for the national movement? It's, it's uh, very well known that people feel more attached to their communities than to the larger organizations. So uh, if you could comment a little bit on the recruitment. And the, the second thing I'd like you to comment on is what, what I've written down here, difficult communities. And that is that to paint the picture as if the communities all agree on what uh, uh, the national movement should do, I, I, I know isn't a fact. And there's also always communities that are more keen, but communities that are also difficult who don't want to participate and don't want to uh, uh, work with the other communities. And if you could tell me a little bit about the tensions between communities and how Masoti Judaism deals with the community that are, are, are less keen. Sure, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, I was hoping I'd get away with some easy questions. Um, so I think, uh, well, first of all, on your first question about how do we get trustees? So the first thing to say, and actually I will answer it directly, but also slightly indirectly. So firstly, um, the maths are in our favor, by which I mean there are um, just over 4, I know Harry says we mustn't count Jews, but there's just over 4,000 adult members of Mazorti in the UK. And in any particular year, because we have roughly one third of the trustees rotates every year. So every year we're looking for three or four people um, out of 4,000. So the first thing is the maths is in our favour. And, you know, that's part, partly why every year we've had more applicants than, than places. However, um, I think the more substantive answer, uh, but which is maybe more relevant for the communities around this screen, is that uh, what Mazorti Judaism does, uh, rather in the same way as, and I'll talk about my experience of, of, of being involved in a smaller community, what Mazorti Judaism does very well is it tries to draw in people, not as trustees, but in other roles. So there's always lots of ongoing projects, small finite projects, sometimes um, more substantive projects. As Harriet mentioned, there's uh, an annual uh, leadership development courses. And, and what we've tended to find is that having kind of drawn people in away from their existing communities into getting involved in smaller Mazorti wide projects, or indeed getting involved in some leadership training with Mazorti. Um, so actually they then typically, not always, but some of those people then go on to say, you know what, I think I'd like to be a trustee as well. So, so, so I think it's partly the maths is in our favor, but even if it wasn't, we're putting in quite a lot of work at the ground level to ensure there is a pipeline of interested people. And, and actually maybe more relevant for this, this tonight, um, I was um, for several years, the co-chair of my own shul, which is in St. Albans, north of London. It's a small community or relatively small community. At the time, 200 adults, it's now 350 adults. Um, so, so there we had a similar size trustee board, and, and but a much smaller number of people to fish in, if you like. It was a tenth of the size of Mazorti Judaism, or a 20th. And, um, and actually, with the techniques we employed then it, were very similar, that we got people in, getting engaged with the shul as smaller projects, sort of outer circle projects, and then gradually brought them closer into the circle until the moment was right to say, ask them, would they consider becoming a trustee? So I think it's, it's those two, two techniques. In terms of managing um, the tensions between the shuls, um, so obviously I'd be lying to you if I said all our shuls get on as one great big happy family. You know, we are after all Jews, and so inevitably we have our fallings outs and our differences. I think one thing that Mazor Judaism has been very good at is, first of all, it's not command and control. It doesn't impose from on high. It doesn't impose uh, rules from the top in the way that other... Jewish denominations in the UK certainly do, which I think gives the individual shuls a degree of operational freedom, if you like. Um, but at the same time, fundamentally, it's about the lines of communications remaining open. So for example, uh, two or three years ago, uh, there was a, a reasonably serious attempt to open up a new Mazorti community in a, in a geography, north of London, but in a geography that would have implications for two existing Mazorti communities. It would be essentially be 
in a similar catchment area. Um, and actually we managed it really well. In the end, we didn't go down that road, but we had a huge number of conversations with those two communities to ensure that their interests were being maintained and looked after, and they felt totally listened to and respected. So I think fundamentally it's about having a decent communication line. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I know that you're also on tight on the clock. And in general, I, I, I can stay on. I've given my apologies. I'm going to the same meeting Matt's going, but he's giving my apologies. So if need be, I can stay on a bit longer. Right. Okay. Then, then, then I feel better because uh, we're on the clock. But uh, uh, Harriet, I'm going to move over uh, uh, to you. And my two questions to you are really, uh, I think the tension with big communities is that uh, they have to give more into the national movement than perhaps the smaller communities. And with New North London, uh, I, I think uh, that the, the symbol is actually sharing your rabbi. Your rabbi is the rabbi of New North London, and it's also the senior rabbi of Masoti Judaism, which I can't believe that there's not tension around why are we sharing resources that we're paying for and that actually should be coming to us? And can you tell me a little bit about potential tensions in the shul and how the shul manages those tensions? That, can I just check? That was one question. That was one question. Uh, no, I basically combined my two questions together. That's fine. It okay. With one question. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, we have a we have we are blessed with a very wonderful and a very particular rabbi and 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 senior rabbi in in Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg. Um, so you're right that New North London shares him with with Masorti Judaism. New North London also shares Rabbi Jonathan with many of his profound commitments, beliefs, and the rest of the world. Um, so I'm not, I, I, I'm actually not sure that I do feel that we think that that's a, um, a tension point for us. Um, and you may want to ask Rabbi Jonathan about whether he feels it's a tension point for him in terms of how he manages his own time. But I actually think that we feel that we only benefit from having a senior rabbi who's very externally connected um, and is a you know, is always a window on the rest of the Masorti world and a window on the rest of the world. I think that um, I, I, I'm not trying to sort of um, gloss over things that we think are attention, but I actually don't think that we feel that that is attention. I'm sure that there is a time commitment challenge that Jonathan himself has to face. Um, but I don't, I don't feel that that's, um, that's actually something that the community um, I think it's something that the community only benefits from. Um, it, it is, I'm not going to hide from the fact that there's a, there is a significant conversation that happens within New North London and between New North London and sort of Judaism about the level of um, fees that we, we as a community contribute to Masorti Judaism. Um, uh, and I, I think it's right that we, there is a, a, a constructive tension about that because we form so much of the membership of Masorti as a whole in the UK because we're such, so much the largest community. Um, that, so that's in if you think about the breakdown of, of, of funds that Matt, Matt talked about, we are a very significant contribution of the membership fees, but because we're the largest community, we're also often somewhere that Masorti Judaism might come to, to talk about when they're thinking about uh, creating a new project that needs funding. And I think the tension for us is making sure that we make the best use of our members' fees and that we're not in effect paying twice, both because our fees are a part of the membership and any additional contribution. Um, but I, I kind of think that tension is OK because I think it's constructive tension. And I think it goes back to the word governance that Simon used at the beginning. I think there should be good scrutiny over how we use our fees. And I think we should be, you know, having the right kind of constructive conversations about um, what's a good use of everybody's, um, you know, kind of contribution overall. Um, so we do have those conversations. We have them quite overtly, I think, with Masorti Judaism, if we've got a concern that we think that it's not the right use of our fees, we will talk about it. Um, 
So I think it's a, a manifest part of our open conversations rather than a kind of um, unspoken tension. Can I, can, I, can I just add something, Chaim, um, if you yes, say please. please. Um, so I think what Harriet said there is exactly right. And I think that the other thing is, and I'm sure Harriet will agree with this, just because New North London's large doesn't mean it's got a monopoly of wisdom on everything. And the reason I frame it like that is because one of the important things that Mazorsi Judaism does in the UK is it tries to share best practice among the different shuls. And, you know, obviously the chances are there's more likely to be good ideas coming out of New North London to be shared with the smaller communities, but it does happen in reverse. You know, it does happen in reverse. And there've been quite a few occasions when I've been engaging with the sort of co-chairs or the executive director of New North London and actually sharing a really good idea that such and such a much smaller shawl has done, which subsequently has then made its way into New North London's programming. So, so you know, it, there, there is a, you know, one of the important things from Mazor's Judaism is that kind of sharing of information across the communities. Uh, and, and you, know, you know, small communities have good ideas as well as big communities. And if I gave the impression that I didn't, no, no, you didn't that, you then did. it was a mistake. No, no you definitely didn't. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to, to all of our speakers, really. And uh, I found it to be uh, really interesting and really quite an inspiring uh, uh, evening. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time. We're a few minutes over the time that we've uh, allocated uh, uh, for this evening. And I think uh, I've, I've been following the chat. If people still have a question, you can put it in the chat. But I think that I'm going to start to bring things up to a close now. And maybe I want to uh, just a few final comments uh, uh, on my own. And uh, I, I think that maybe the thing that I want to say is that in many ways, communities are similar to, to people. They have their own identity and they also have their own life cycle. And young children get lots of help from the outside. They have lots of needs. And small communities have lots of needs. And in order to thrive and in order to succeed, they need the larger communities to be able to contribute and to give to them and the role of the national organizations with the small communities is to understand their needs and to make sure that the support is available so that those communities can thrive and they can grow and they can become medium-sized communities. People stop being children, they become adult. And when you become adults, you have lots of responsibilities. You, you, you may choose to marry, you'll have a family, you might have a home, you have lots of expenses, you have lots of needs and uh, medium-sized -sized communities, they struggle with different types of issues. And uh, the, the medium-sized communities, those are the communities that need help hiring their rabbis. Those are the communities that uh, need help with the education programs. Those are the communities that reach out more for the youth activities. And uh, the role of the national organization for the medium-sized communities is to provide lots of practical help in how to do things. They don't need to give. It doesn't need to do for. It needs to give the, share the knowledge to enable those communities to do those things for themselves. The large communities are like older people. When you reach your later years in life, you start to think beyond yourself. You start to think about your continuity. What are you handing on to your children? Where are your children going to go? You start to think about your legacy. After me, what's going to remain for me? What were my values? What's going to continue into the future? And large communities, if they're really successful, they don't just think about how I hire the rabbi or, or, or how I get new members, but they think about what's beyond us. It's the, the Judaism that I believe in 
how do I make sure that that Judaism continues to thrive? How do I, how do I make sure that there's something there for the next generation? And it's the larger communities that then reach out to the national organization because the big goals of continuity are very hard to achieve within one community. And it's the larger communities that look to the national organization for the big question to promote the values, to promote uh, uh, the kind of thinking, to, to promote the organization, to, to provide for the future generations. So every community has a need for a national organization. They're not the same needs, but where it's successful, where you can marry between the, the, the resources that there are in large communities and the needs that there are in small communities, where you can, when you can bring that whole picture together successfully, then there's room for, for the movement as a whole to thrive. And ultimately, communities thrive if the movement thrives. And if the movement suffers, then the communities themselves are going to suffer. So we've taken the time this evening to, to, to talk about our uh, uh, national organization. We saw one example of what's happening in Minnesota, UK, but as I said, it's not our only national organization. And we want this to be the beginning of a conversation. And I look forward to having that conversation with Masorti France and with Masorti Spain and with Masorti uh, uh, in uh, Germany and in Sweden and in the other countries to, to talk about how do we broaden our thinking? How do we think beyond our communities? How do we promote our movement as a whole? And how can we be strategic about our growth so that we're a stronger movement in the future. So that's, uh, I, I think, where we're coming to a close. This is the beginning of a series. In two weeks' time, we have uh, uh, the next of our sessions, which uh, unfortunately has just gone out of my mind. So if someone could step in now and tell me what's Noam. the next, Noam. Session, the next section is on Noam, which is on the, the youth movements. Yeah. So, so uh, looking at the other side of the spectrum, but all of our communities kind of ask themselves, what do we do with our youth? And how are we successful in providing uh, uh, activities for our youth? So in our next session, we're going to be looking at NOAM in our different countries, who does it best, and what can we learn from each other? So I hope that as many people as possible can join us in two weeks time. And just thank you to everyone for, for joining us this evening. Uh, I really appreciate that so many people have given of their time uh, uh, to, to present, but also to, to be here and to listen and to take it back to your own communities. And once again, thank you to our speakers who uh, made this evening possible.